Um, the whole idea of this session is there, there is um, the, the, the current economic system, one of the characteristics of it is the very difficult time regular folk who would try to develop, start businesses, um, build for the community and the community's needs have in accessing the finance um, that's required to do that. So we wanted to put in perspective the, the whole of that, I mean, why that's important, and then talk about some of our thinking on how we can build democratic financial structures that transform that in such a way as to allow communities to better meet their needs and elevate the quality of life. Um, the earth that was found, it was not created, it was not made by anyone, it wasn't the, a stroke of genius or really hard work or, or uh, discipline or delayed gratification that gave us the earth. It was out there. Uh, that earth was at one time available to the people of the earth to make good use of, to meet their needs. In fact, that's the only way that human needs uh, can get met. You grow food in the earth, you t cut down trees that grow in the earth, you take rocks and build bricks out of, them, out of the earth. Uh, you find minerals that you want to use something with from the earth. The earth is needed and it's a part of it, but somebody took it one day. A group of folk take it, they claim they own it, and once they own it, then the access to it is limited to the conditions in which they set. But in addition to the earth itself having been taken away and out of the control and utilization of the people to meet needs and elevate the quality of life, human labor is capable of creating value. Um, once you take a rock and you shape it in a certain kind of way, it's actually more valuable than the rock and the dust that it was before you've, you've done it. Once you smelt gold and beat it out into beautiful jewelry, it's more valuable than it was when it was raw stuff. So we create value all the time, uh, value-added agriculture. Once we take it and put it in plastic bags, somehow we think it's more valuable because we certainly pay more money for it. Um, so th this, this value added by labor ends up producing surplus over time because we're able to produce more than we need. And since we can produce more than we need, the extra is either stored up um, or appropriated or taken by somebody. We're talking about the form of that that becomes mon monified at some point and it becomes finance. And right now the world is characterized by having a great big pile of money in it. We're talking about trillions of dollars and there's some argument as to whether or not in real dollars it's something on the neighborhood of 14 or 15 trillion or maybe it's in the 80 trillions of dollars, but it's a huge pile of money that exists in the world that represents the dead value of human labor that is done on an earth that people found. So all of this ought to be the value of labor from these communities ought to be at the disposal of those communities, again, to meet needs and elevate the quality of life, but it's not. Um, our effort is to engage in a process to start talking about building a new commons, both of nature itself and of the wealth created by labor that is right now held in, in a handful of hands around the world and make this commonly available to the communities so that we don't have people who are capable of and willing to work to meet their needs and, and, and take care of their families and their communities who are unable to do so because they cannot access the tools that are required to do that in this modern world. And that's the situation that we have, that's what we're trying to break. We're trying to do it in a non-extractive way and developing some new tools of non-extractive finance. So we have on our panel today, Brendan Martin from The Working World, who has done an incredible amount of work over the years in developing some ideas around non-extractive finance that have been developed through some of the work he's done in Argentina and in New York and in Chicago and around the country now. Mi Michelle Mascarina Swan, who is working with Movement Generation and uh, is part of a process uh, that we're gonna talk about toward building a financial cooperation, uh, cooperative that is involved with a political movement around creating something that she's gonna describe in detail, reinvest in our power. And we have Kate Poole, who is with Regenerative Finance, a group of young people who have participated in some of the projects that we're talking about that demonstrate the capacity um,
to have a new idea toward the nature of finance and how it's going to operate. So with that, that was actually five minutes. I, I did it. So, <laughs> yeah, excuse me. So, Brendan, we, we want Brendan to start out talking about the nature of regenerative finance and what it, what it means, how it's important, and how it is possible. Non-extractive finance. Or non, yeah, the non, I'll start with non-extractive. Oh. That's, hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Brendan Martin. I, I work in an organization called The Working World, which provides capital uh, to mostly worker-owned businesses, uh, sometimes other kinds of cooperatives and other kinds of community-owned um, enterprise and, and productive activity. So to start out, um, to follow on what Ed just laid out there, the first one would be like, why are we talking about um, finance and money this much? Why does this matter so much in, in the context that we're in? And the answer, the first answer we have is that money has become the most powerful force in the world. When you want to express power now, you actually do it more by amassing a pile of money than by taking political office. That most decisions on the allocation of resources are adjudicated through the distribution and exchange of money rather than through political power. Pyramids used to be built by incredible organizations of political um, people in, this, in, in states, and now they're built by people who have enough money. Uh, so money is a starting point for us of that of all the things the economy that we're trying to make new or change or old again, um, the money is a linchpin there. Money is, is this linchpin of, of the nexus of power in that economy. We talk about money, but we're not just talking about any money. We're, we're going to talk specifically about finance. Why? Because we're not, when we're saying that people who have a lot of money um, have power, it's not just because of the consumption choices they manage to make. Um, that they make however much we like or don't like them, uh, but about the investment choices. It's about their it, people with piles of money can make choices to uh, buy your property, buy your neighborhoods, build your factories, uh, build the bridges. They can, people with investment capital not making the decisions over what affects the lives of other people in the world. Once upon a time, to take over a neighborhood, move all the people out of it, um, would be colonialism. Now it's just a market exchange with people who have enough money to do that. Um, as long as they're in your same country as you, it's not one country invading another. It's just, a, it's just someone who's wealthier than someone else. Um, so it's really investment uh, that builds the things people need, those tools that Ed pointed out that are necessary to meet your, need, your needs. Uh, it's investment that, that uh, creates those things and controls those things. An investment so that's the first point, uh, that for us, um, we're focused on money and investment because that is where so much the locus of power in our current economy is. And the second point about investment is that it is extractive and it's nature, the way investment works. So as Ed um, pointed out, maybe in an earlier talk, uh, that <laughs> now that I think about it, uh, money that, is, that makes mo money off of money, rather than makes money off of labor. So you put money away and you get more money out of it. That is the mechanism of investment. It's about having a pile of capital, putting it somewhere and getting more back. And by its very nature, we'll say, is extractive. It's about, because um, someone's put in labor and someone has and they just put in capital to get more, the value was created through labor that gets brought back to the investor as extraction. Um, extraction is where there are, not everyone is the same, you're not in one, collective. You have different parties, and one party gets to take from the other party off of their labor, off their, uh, rob, off of their property. Um, that's, that's what extraction is. It, 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 to talk about extraction necessitates talking about a power imbalance between people and the earth, between people and each other. Um, and we, as we describe it, it finance is extraction perfected. People are very aware of extraction. They think about mining and such. But think about mining and extend that to the whole economy. And that's what finance um, does. When in a financial exchange, when I decide to invest in a factory, in a village, um, that has a ton of impact in the village that hires people or fires people, it changes the economic landscape village, it maybe pollutes the river or it builds things. All the things it might do to all those human beings on the planet they're in are absolutely abstracted from the relationship it ha has with the investor as in the one who made all the decisions. The only thing I see as an investor is the financial return to the investor, not even the financial return that it may or may not have for people in that village. All I see is what money I'm able to extract out of it. All my decisions are made as a, as a decision of extraction. How much do I extract out of it? That's why I make that investment. 
um, not for the good or bad or anything, any impact it has on that village. Um, so that's why we say finance is extraction perfected. As we also point out, um, it's so effective culturally for us that they've managed to convince most Americans to get into this extractive game and put their money in, say, a 401k. When people look at their 401k, that means they have money that was theirs that's invested in companies all over the world. They don't look at what were the activities of those companies. Who, what, who, what people do they impact? Did they pay those people well? Did they fire them? Did they create villages? Did they destroy them? They, all they look at is the bottom line of how much money did their 401k return at the end of the year. Um, it's become so culturally normal for us that no one demands their, but you got, this isn't what I was asking for. I want to know what my investment did to the world. No one does that. Even if you might have invested in companies that are, um, that are kicking your mother out of her house, the same company that's foreclosing on her home, your 401k invest, could be invested in, and we're not even asking that question. The extraction perfected of finance has become so normal um, that people engage in it every day without question. So if that's extraction perfect, if that's, non -extra if that's extractive finance, what would non-extractive finance be? Um, and in extractive finance, capital controls people. Capital is the agent, as I said, the investor. The capital gets to decide what happens in that village and makes choices based on extractive principles. How much money do I get back? In a non-extractive exchange, there isn't an extraction. There is not another agent outside. The agents are the people in the village. Uh, it's people controlling money, not money controlling people. Uh, it's people hiring and then firing money, not money hiring and firing people. Um, so non-extractive finance, um, it's, it looks like, in, in there's a place in Spain called Mondragon that was a cooperative, um, it's, it, it's a village that has now tons and tons of cooperatives and they have a bank at the center of that village. And they started in the 50s. They've grown um, tremendously since then. As a poor village with a tiny bit of money, their first few hundred dollars they put in the bank have now grown to billions of dollars. But that bank has an operational principle, not just a moral philosophy, but an operational principle that capital must be subordinate and instrumental to the needs of people and the needs of labor. Uh, and that, that's an operating principle that they've used for all that time to grow from hundreds of dollars to billions. And what did that mean? That meant they, that bank is not maximizing its profit. That bank is controlled by the people of that community um, and only invests in where they want to invest in. And it had to invest in worker-owned businesses in that village, and that's what it did. It couldn't just move its money to wherever it made the most in the world and move it into oil in the North Sea or anything else. It had to invest in its village. And the process of that has created one of the wealthiest, most successful parts of northern Spain and an incredible community, uh, not a perfect one, but an incredibly interesting one to look at um, and envy of any kind of economic development in the world. Why? Because they controlled their own capital in a non-extractive way. Um, I've been engaged as the working world um, in trying to bring this kind of non-extractive finance um, to parts of the Americas. It's not, it's been, in, it, this is traditional to have non-extractive finance, to be clear. It's the modern world and, and capitalism that has changed that relationship. So it's also just bringing it back and trying to bring it up to, to a scale that can compete with current extractive finance. Um, I lived in, um, I lived in Argentina for a number of years where we started a non-extractive investment fund that supported worker-owned businesses. Uh, factories that were taken over by the workers in Argentina um, still needed capital, and their only choice was to go to the extractive capital markets who didn't even want to lend to them. Uh, so with my colleague there, Maria Eva in the front row, hi Maria, um, we and a number of other people in Argentina uh, started a fund that would invest in businesses that only got paid back if those, were, those cooperative businesses were successful. Normally you'd say, well, if you're not, not going to be successful, then you've got to give us your car or your house or something. Um, or if you're not going to do that, then we have to control it. This was a, you know, if we're going to invest in it, then we own it. If we're going to lend you money, you've got to put up collateral. We did neither of those things. And we put the money in and said, we're on the hook unless it's successful. And that changed entirely the relationship we would have with the cooperatives. Um, Often a business, if they're in trouble, the last person they want to have to call is their creditor because their creditor, if they know they're in trouble, might want to call that loan. I mean, creditors often have to require them to call them in their contracts because they know they don't want to. Because our, the cooperatives we worked with knew we only could be paid back if they were successful, they knew we were on the hook to make sure that they could be successful. We're often their first call. They're like, oh, we're in trouble. Hey, guys, guess what? We're in trouble, and we'd have to come and help um, because we were in the service of those cooperatives, which is the opposite of a place a normal bank is. So this was our experimentation uh, in trying to build a non-extractive, subordinate 
source of capital in Argentina over many years. We worked with hundreds of factories, made um, over 800 of these investment loans, these non-extractive subordinate investment loans. Um, despite what the financial world would tell you, that, well, I know it doesn't seem, and I'm going to end right here, it doesn't seem great to have to, um, it doesn't seem, I know we have to be extractive, that's the only way we can survive, or else the banks would go away and then you wouldn't have bank money that helps so much. Um, it, in spite of that, they would have said, well, if you guys try to do non-extractive finance in a bankrupt country to work your own businesses, you're going to go out of business, 98% of those loans paid back in full and we never had a down year. So I'm going to pass it on. You want to introduce Michelle? Or? No. So with that, I'll pass it on to Michelle, who's going to talk more about that experience. Thank you. Thanks. So again, I'm Michelle Mascareña Swan with um, the Movement Generation Justice and Ecology Project, and today I'm also going to be talking about um, reinvest. Well, what I'm mainly going to be talking about is reinvest in our power, um, which is something that Brendan, Ed, like lots of folks that are here at the at the conference have been working to build um, for the past two, let well in the U.S. two two years. Um, it, um, so essentially we, um, you know, Brendan began, um, telling the story to many folks here in, in the U.S. about what folks were building in Argentina to, to create a financial, co uh, financial commons, essentially. Um, what would it look like if we were able to put our, um, put capital in a, a pooled fund that workers could access when they needed the capital to um, buy, their, buy, buy the equipment that they needed that the factory owners had taken out of the country, for example, what, which would happen in Argentina, or they needed just a little more um, investment to upgrade their factory to make it profitable, um, that, um, that pulling that together would give them the kind of power that in the economy that, that would support them um, you know, making their businesses actually regenerative. Um, so. This helped us to think about um, how a financial cooperative um, could be formed here in the U.S. Um, that would not just um, not just be part of uh, building these local loan funds, but actually rooted in building the kind of political power that will help to wield that economic power as as you know, an agent of change in the economy that actually has larger scale and force than any one, in, any one factory or even loan fund could in and of itself. Um, so that initiative we talk about as reinvest in our power. Um, I'm gonna just go through quickly kind of the structure of it and how it operates and we can talk more about the stories and details later. Um, so again, we can think about this as two parts. On the right, no, the left side in the purple is the financial cooperative, which Brendan um, and Ed mentioned. It, and on the right side is reinvestment campaign. So as folks know, you know, this is a moment in which we're all very clear that the extractive, like the pillage and plunder of the planet um, and her peoples is, um, has to come to an end. Um, and we're in the midst of a transition, like it or not. And so, um, there's lots of forces that are organizing to challenge power in ways that can, um, can help us transform the economy. And students are, and young people are one of those forces um, challenging fossil fuels, um, increasingly challenging prisons, and other forms of extraction. Um, and so um, grassroots groups from the Climate Justice Alliance, um, folks from the South who were engaged in building economic democracy from from Boston, from other places, came together with the working world um, and many other groups um, to talk about how could we build reinvestment campaigns that would not just force universities to divest from fossil fuels, that's great, but, um, but those are really symbolic, right? How do we actually move that capital into not just clean tech or green tech, which is where we were seeing that flow, but actually move it into the kind of productive enterprises that can support communities in regenerating um, economy. And so the pairing of these two sets of, of activities, we feel is a really critical lever for a just transition. 
Um, so the financial cooperative, the idea of it essentially is that um, there are these local loan funds. Can folks hear me if I keep this down a little bit? Or is that too low? Okay, live stream. Hi, people. Um, uh, so the financial cooperative is comprised by and, and governed by the local loan funds. This is really a critical piece of information, right? Right now, decisions are made far, far, far from where the impacts are felt, right? We know this in the streets. We know this in, in our communities, you know, the factories that spew pollution outside of our, um, of many people's, especially black and brown communities, um, doors are, are not asking at all the workers from those factories or the communities that, that um, suffer the impacts. And so what we have to do actually is shift governance at the root of it, shift governance of the economy increasingly to um, the people who are doing that work and who live with the consequences of those impacts. And so these local loan funds are about that. Um, so as you can see, we're sort of coming together. There is a coming together of communities across the U.S. Um, to join together in this financial cooperative. There are three kind of core, oh, here's some pictures actually. So um, that's an image from Argentina, right? Um, on the top left from the working world. Um, then there's the Southern Reparations Loan Fund, which Ed and Marnie and many other people that are in here are a part of. Um, these are some of the loan funds or emerging loan funds that are part of the financial cooperative. There's Cooperation Richmond, that's pictures of rich city rides and, and urban tilth. Um, and so the financial cooperative really has three key functions. It's about shared learning, shared services, and shared capital. Um, and maybe just to back up a second, we think of this as, as in parallel to um, like a seed library, right? Do folks, folks heard of seed libraries? Um, and what are some of the core functions, or what are some of the ways that a seed library operates? Just shout it out. I know it doesn't feel very participa participatory in here, but. See, like, what is a seed library for? You get free seeds and you plant them. That's cool. To, to pass on the genes of especially rare heirloom seeds. Yeah, how do they operate? How do they function? Do you just get them and then you go plant them and that's it? And then, okay. And then you get new seeds and you give those back, right? So there's a critical function that you have to return more than what you took. Or, or something equivalent, at least, to what you took. But you don't just return the seeds, you actually return the knowledge about what, how you grew the seeds, what the conditions were, what you got from those seeds, right? And, then, and that actually returns more. That, that's more than just the seeds itself. Um, the, the other thing that's critical about it is that you're helping to govern it. So somebody said here, you know, you want rare or heirloom seeds. There's a reason for that. So you're making decisions about what kinds of seeds or how you're, you know, how you're um, managing the seeds by running a seed library in that way. And the, and the financial commons or the financial cooperative is very much that way. It's the commons of capital. And so it's critical that shared learning is a part of it. Did I skip one? No. Um, that, I can't read that, but you can see. Um, essentially, shared learning is the peers across the financial cooperative, these local loan funds, are learning from one another as they're developing and emerging. So they're, they're sharing best practices. The working world is the, the oldest and largest of the loan funds in the financial cooperative. And so they're providing a lot of the initial like peer guidance and, and wisdom. And the loan, other loan funds are benefiting from that, from that knowledge. And increasingly, um, the other loan funds will you know, serve as peers to new emerging loan funds. And so the idea is that that's a regenerative process, right? So shared learning is key. Um, shared services, so the back-end services that local loan funds need, the SEC compliance, the IRS filings, not everybody has to recreate the wheel. Um, the working world has, you know, has to do that for their own loan fund. They're already developing back-end services then, and, and we're raising money to develop like, increased infrastructure to support new emerging loan funds to, um, you know, to provide those back-end services. And then finally, shared capital. 
critical. Um, and a, a, an important thing to note about this is that, um, you know, I think about this process as um, like the, the sponge is a good metaphor for this. So um, if we dump a bunch of capital in a community that has been totally starved from access to capital um, and the, the tools to make that capital productive, it probably won't be soaked up in the best, in, in like the best way possible. But if we can find ways to slow it, spread it, sink it deeply, um, and that means kind of wetting the sponge first. You know, you don't take a bone dry sponge and try to mop up a spill, a huge spill. You actually wet the sponge first so that you can then take up much more. And so that's, the pro that's what we're doing right now. And so these loan funds initially are making some small loans. They're learning from it. They're, they're organizing around it in communities to identify right projects. Um, but that means they're, they're not individually able to take up a ton of capital yet. Um, but collectively, we can aggregate the, the needs and scale it up. Uh-oh, thanks, Ed. Um, and then last, I'll just talk about the reinvestment campaigns. We're talking about then linking student forces with these local loan funds and grassroots groups to create the kinds of reinvestment demands that students can lead with that are not just about, we're not just drawing down uh, money from the extractive industries, but we're actually demanding then that the universities invest them in a non-extractive way, as Brendan was referring to. Um, and then I'll just end, these are some of the partners, um, and um, we are excited to talk more with you about it. I wanted to introduce Kate. Um, one of the questions always comes up is like, you're gonna do a what? <laughs> How you, where are you going to get people that are going to make money available for this crazy new process? And Brendan has had his own sources over the years. Um, and one of the emerging sources is some work we're doing with a uh, really interesting group of young people that have been very, very helpful, and that is regenerative finance. Kate Poole works with regenerative, is part of regenerative finance, and has already been involved in one of the loans that was structured through the work of the working world in this non-extractive way for the development of the Renaissance Community Grocery Store in Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but I wanted to say that in talking about Kate's description of uh, one of the ways that, that money can come into a process like this, one of the ways. Thanks, I appreciate that framing a lot. Um, yeah, I'm definitely up here as a uh, rich person that is uh, somehow been roped into this project. And I'm going to talk about like how that happened and why I think it's important. Um, so I'm a leader with Regenerative Finance, which is a collective of eight young people with wealth who have been organizing for the past three years. It emerged out of Resource Generation, which is another group that organizes young people with wealth who are interested in social justice. And um, it came out of a workshop that was co-organized uh, with Gopal, um, who's also a part of Movement Generation. And the frame of the workshop was how can we take direct action at the scale of finance? Um, and how can we take risks? And so we came out of that workshop really excited, but also a little unsure. We were thinking about doing like an anti-capitalist hedge fund, which was uh, kind of shot down as potentially too complicated. Um, and then we were talking about pooling capital, which was shot down as illegal. Um, and so we were beginning to organize together, figure out how we could take collective action, and a bunch of folks attended the Jackson Rising convening, which was two summers ago, in Jackson, Mississippi, and um, there made a commitment to investing in the Black South and learning from movement partners that were developing a strong framework around reparations and why it's important for accumulated wealth, um, which comes from extraction, to be put back and uh, reinvested in communities that it's been taken from. So there was this interest in investing in the Black South and um, understanding the history of wealth that's been accumulated as tied to slavery, as tied to racism in this country, as based on stolen land from indigenous people, um, who were murdered and exiled by white settlers. And 
Um, so there was this developed framework of reparations and a moral responsibility for taking accumulated wealth that we had access to and uh, reinvesting it in communities and um, an emphasis on wealth redistribution rather than wealth accumulation. And so these frames are really useful, but kind of the questions came up. So we want to redistribute wealth and we want to attempt to do some small piece of reparations. And then we're looking at the impact investing space, which has such different norms around kind of what it looks like to reinvest wealth. It was um, a lot of people talking about how important it was to invest in green technology or these other false solutions um, that weren't addressing systemic issues. And so the questions that were coming up for us were, should people with accumulated wealth continue to accumulate wealth on the backs of the communities that they claim to be helping under the guise of impact investing? Which we thought, no. Um, and then should rich investors um, decide which projects and businesses in communities should have access to capital? We also thought the answer to that was no. Um, and so as we were kind of beginning to figure out how to disrupt these norms and impact investing spaces, um, Marnie reached out to us from Fund for Democratic Communities, works with Ed, and um, asked us if we would be interested in investing in this emerging project, Renaissance Community Co-op. And um, I think many of you have probably heard about that in different spaces. It's a consumer-owned grocery store. Um, it's been in a food desert in Northeast Greensboro. It's been 18 years since they had a grocery store. Um, the store that was there was profitable, but not profitable enough, so it was shut down. And the community tried to recruit a store to come in, but the capitalist structures were not interested in investing in the community. Um, and Jay Jones and Mo and lots of people involved with RCC are here at this conference if you want to connect and learn more about that project. And so Marnie explained that the city of Greensboro was going to put in a certain amount of money and there was maybe some hedging happening or that money wasn't going to come through. And so if they couldn't figure out how to fill this gap, it's possible that the capital all this layered capital that had been set up over uh, you know, uh, years and years of work was potentially going to crumble. And would we be interested in raising $100,000, uh, zero percent interest loan over a 14 to 20 year term? And we said, yeah, sure. Um, and we weren't really sure if it was going to work. Um, and we, about two weeks after we talked about it, we had a webinar. Oh, and we reached out to Brendan. We said, is it possible for us to pool capital and move it under these terms? to this project and he said sure <laughs> and so two weeks after that we had a webinar um, and I know everyone loves a webinar but we managed to get maybe 20 people on a webinar to learn about the opportunity um, to invest in RCC and um, on that 75 minute webinar after you know Marnie and uh, Jay and Ed shared about RCC and after Brendan explained that we were doing a thing together uh, that was this investment. We asked how much people would be ready to invest under those terms at 0% over a kind of 15 year term. And we raised $100,000 on that webinar um, that night. That was about two years ago. And that was a real shock to me. You know, I wasn't really sure if wealthy people would be willing to come into this project, but I think that the story is strong enough and the moral responsibility is clear enough um, that we're gonna be able to move a lot of capital in that way. And so the first 100K um, that we raised was able to leverage about 250,000 out of the city of Greensboro. And then over the next year after that, we raised another um, 153,000. So we ended up going in 253,000 from about 38 wealthy investors at 0% non-collateralized, non-extractive terms like Brendan explained earlier. Um, and that was from 38 investors total. And so I think that as regenerative finance, we're learning that there are a lot of block, there are many blocks to having wealthy investors redistribute wealth and commit to making reparations and recognizing the history of where their wealth um, is accumulated from. But there's also a lot of possibility and a lot of uh, excitement about investing in non-extractive finance and investing in community controlled loan funds. Um, and I think that um, as a person with a lot of power and privilege and wealth, it, um, I don't know, it's deeply important to feel 
to show up as my full self, which includes bringing to bear my resources and to figure out ways of leveraging resources and access I have to move money into these projects. And um, it's been deeply meaningful work and I'm really excited to talk to other people with wealth that are interested in moving resources into this project um, or people that are wealthy and confused about whether they want to move resources into the project. Okay, I wanted to take about another five minutes to talk about another fund that is developing, uh, which is the Southern Reparations Loan Fund. Um, the Southern Reparations Loan Fund has uh, grew out of the work uh, that was started several years ago, the development of the Southern Grassroots Economies Project, but now it is incorporated as a, as a simple incorporation in the state of North Carolina so that it can sign contracts to and a memorandum of understanding with the working world to be part, a component group of the financial cooperative in the ways that we were talking about. The reason why it uses the reparations framework is because there are damages that have taken place that for which repair is needed. And we like to think about the whole question of finance as being part of that structure of repair. It's not all of it, but it's, it's an important part of it. And I want to tell just a quick story from South Africa that I heard from a guy named Bugani Finka, who's involved in the Truth and Reconciliation Project, about an old man named Smith and a, and a guy named Tabo. And um, Smith was a, was a white settler there in South Africa. And when he heard about the Truth and Reconciliation Process, he, uh, he realized that he could be forgiven for what he had done under this new black government that was coming in if he would just come and tell the truth. So he comes to the meeting and says, you know, I, I remember you, Tabo. Uh, I remember you had a family, and you had a farm, and you had a cow, and I came and I, I took your cow, and I know it devastated your family, and for a long time you all were hardly able to eat and stuff, and I realize now that this was completely wrong, and I want you to please forgive me, it was wrong, I should not have done it, and I'm truly sorry, and Pablo said, you know, I'm, I am able to forgive you, that's all right, and so they, they hugged each other, and they cried together, and they probably even prayed together, and then Smith is walking out of the room, and Tabo goes, whoa, wait a minute. He said, well, what do you want? He said, what about the cow? And Smith goes, you're ruining our reconciliation. This has nothing to do with the cow. OK, the problem is it does. And so when we talk about reparations, we're talking about the cow, the many cows that have been taken in the course that destroyed damaged families and left the devastated landscape of the South and that's where I live, I've lived all my life. And so the Southern Reparations Loan Fund is looking to create a way so that we can talk about the cow, the cows, and put, make communities whole again. Um, so we're organized along these lines of uh, non-extractive finance. Our early capital will come from, part of it's coming out of philanthropy with the Fund for Democratic Community, threw in $150,000 to start off with that the working world said, ah, I got you, I'll match you $150,000. Uh, and we have been working along with regenerative finance and have now growing access to capital. We get, uh, Fund for Democratic Community is paying for a loan officer who's traveling around and working on projects in Arkansas, Mississippi, and Florida right now with potential cooperative things along the line of non-extractive finance, and in particular, upholding the principles of radical inclusivity which is to say we want to make sure that loans are available to the kind of people banks wouldn't dream of lending any money to uh, for the purpose of um, alone the principles of non-extractive finance so we're not taking as collateral any pre-existing business assets we're not threatening anyone's home ownership we're not even threatening their their prior existing business assets uh, we're only talking about if you help buy somebody something, if you buy them their second truck and they decide to close the business, you might take that truck back if they change their mind about it, but you're not going to take the truck they already owned, non-extractive in those ways. And also this idea of maximizing community benefits, the Southern Reparation Loan Fund is only interested in lending to cooperative businesses. Not just worker co-op businesses, but cooperative businesses because we also recognize that a community like this community in Northeast Greensboro can decide that there's a community activity that it wants and a community need that is to be met 
and this need is broader just than their consumer needs. It is a need both for good jobs as well as the need for access to food in the community, and it can own this financial entity. It can hire the management that's going to operate it in such a way that this community need can be met and elevate the quality of life and, quite frankly, help build hope and, and, and excitement in the community, which is what that process has meant to it. Uh, we're glad that we have all of the people on the stage have been involved in one way or the other in helping to build and deliver on that dream that is coming true in Greensboro with the opening of the RCC co-op that will happen uh, sometimes uh, in early fall. And we are looking to let folks know, I got to shut up. But now we're going to open up to questions and answers. Make it stop. Make it stop. We're going to open up to questions and answers. And, uh, and if you ask me some questions about it, I can talk more about what I was just talking about. <laughs> I'm just a moderator on this panel. I have no control over it because we agreed on the rules. Uh, <laughs> so are there, are there questions? Oh, I have a question. How many people here are, think they might be interested in starting a loan fund at some point? Wow, that's good. How many people here think they're interested or have some projects that they're working on that they would like to seek finance from some kind of non-extractive loan fund like we have? Okay, another good group. How many people here uh, are just curious? Okay. Same guy raised his hand three times. <laughs> all of, that, that's the box that's marked all of the above, and he just checked it. Okay, we just wanted to get a little sense of, of who was in the room. And, um, but now it is open to your questions to us, and we can talk some more. We have, a little, we have some time left. Yes, sir. Uh, I think we need to do a mic thing where somebody, if you can pass a mic down and we'll run it around to the people in the audience who are asking questions. Just a, a minor ground rule on the question. You know that speech you were hoping you were going to get a chance to give <laughs> at Common Bound? <laughs> what we want to do is, is have you ask a, a question that hopefully we can talk about and make sure that we make some space for everybody in the room to get a chance to ask some questions. That was my minor thing. Hi. For investments in the financial cooperative, are investors going to be targeting a specific loan fund within it? And or is there an option to just kind of fund any fund that needs extra capital? Because I could see some winners and some losers depending on regions and different factors. Um, the, the, the simple answer, the, the best is to put it in the general fund. And the whole idea is to take the, to the, the investors, not the agent making those decisions and the, the community does it together. So while it, it can happen, uh, because right now the, the financial cooperative is just in the market trying to find the best capital it can, and sometimes that'll be the way it is. And um, it's a very locally based, there's local money available from a city that has to invest in its own city. Could happen, and we might decide it's worth taking. But as much as possible, cooperative is benefited by um, not just focusing on yourself, but by everyone getting to then uh, share it cooperatively. Does that make sense? Okay, good, great. Yes, yeah, sir. Actually, yeah, let's try that. Let's try to take two or three questions and then. <laughs> is that more interesting? <laughs> Michelle <laughs> finds it more interesting for us to take. Like, well, that's cool. Like yes, because we can answer two or three questions at one time because they fold into the complex ideas we're sharing. <laughs> Got it. Hi, uh, this is always super easy. Uh, there's already one loan that has gone out sort of under through your the financial cooperative model, and maybe uh, I thought it may be great to kind of hear how did it work uh, for the folks who might be interested in joining. Okay, that's, let's, let's get another question. So I apologize, I missed the first part. You may have commented on this, but in terms of the actual loan funds, you mentioned how you didn't want to extract from the actual co-op businesses or, or other people who might submit to the loan fund. What role does credit history play in that process for a co-op that would want to get funded or an entity that would want to get funded? Very good question. And we'll, let's take one more. Okay. I just have a kind of a general question about um, uh, just 
governance and decision making within the loan funds and kind of you know how you handle issues of governance, uh, inclusivity, representation, and so on, uh, and, and how that plays out in the real world when making decisions about which projects to fund and which not. Okay, that's is that cool. Is that enough questions at once? Okay. You want a, a governance? He was asking a question about how the governance works out in terms of, of the loan funds and all. So um, I'll talk about governance. So I think one key thing to note is that we are working to turn on its head the relationship between investors and the work, the people who should be actually driving decision making about the economy, and on its head, right? We're reversing that order. And so you know, this relates to your question as well. Um, it, that as much as we can, we are working to make those decisions through the financial cooperative, where the financial cooperative has a governance structure that includes a committee that is um, charged with, um, you know, like, like making the decisions about when a loan is ready to be funded. Um, and that that relates to a whole set of conversations that is happening across those loan funds about what the political priorities are for political and economic priorities are for the the, um, the financial cooperative as a whole that's helping to drive us towards you know where we're trying to get to um, and so just as as an example I mean we just came out of a network gathering yesterday um, which was really great we had representatives like good robust delegations from eight of the peers. Um, some of those are already loan funds, operating loan funds. Most of them are just emerging as, as, as developing loan funds and incubators. Um, and we practiced what it looks like to govern um, pools of money. In this case, we're talking about gift capital because we need operating capital to get these loan funds off, off the ground and up and running. Um, and we talked about things like, what does it look like to, like, what are our priorities? Is it about getting some of the ones going that are almost there? Like, if they just had an infusion of, of money, they could hire their loan officer and they could get their, their loan fund running because we need some examples of things that are, that are up and running? Or is it those places that have been extremely excluded from capital, like the Deep South, like the like Detroit or you know other places in the in the Rust Belt or the Midwest um, or indigenous you know communities are those places that we need to be prioritizing and we had a really robust discussion across our loan funds and other you know other groups within reinvest in our power about what that looks like and so I think just to just to reiterate like that the process of turning on its head, um, the role, in this case, it's of philanthropy, because we're actually trying to increasingly get money out of the hands of, uh, you know, of foundations and put it into our movements to be able to drive money where it needs to flow based on movement level decisions. Um, this was an example of that, of that work. And then increasingly, we're trying to do that with capital as well, but, but through very informed, um, um, governance where workers who've gone through these processes can can lead the, the process of approving loan funds and, um, and, and, and loan officers that have been gone through these processes are approving loans from other, um, other sites that are, are, are supporting them and being loan ready um, to make sure that, you know, we're all in this together. I want to say a little bit more about uh, credit, the, the role of your your credit rating, I guess that's part of what you're asking. Um, you know, there's, there's this whole process for traditional lending, talk about the five C's of credit. And when you get them all together, it's basically, it's a question of, you know, d are you gonna be able to pay this loan back? And even if you were able to, you're the kind of person who's gonna do what you're able to and, and in fact pay it back. The credit question in particular asks the question of, have you had trouble paying back loans in the past? And that may or may not be an interesting question. Um, when, in fact, you're on the same side of the table that the finance is on the same side of the table as the borrower because you're dependent on the success of the business, the real considerations are, do you have a sound business thing that you're working on doing that we can work on together and, us, and we'll help you figure out how to do this successfully? So at the, at the point when regenerative finance was working with the working world, to figure out how to help finance the RCC, 
I don't remember there being a credit check done. In fact, I know for a fact that there was not. And in the course of our work right now that we have a loan officer that's working with some people, again, in Mississippi and Arkansas and some other places, she's not asking to see people's credit histories. It, she doesn't care. Uh, we don't care. Uh, what we want to know is what is your business plan and how can we help you make that robust enough so that this infusion of additional capital into your business is actually going to generate the kind of return coming back so that it helps you grow, so that it doesn't waste your time and hours on dumping something into something that's, that's not viable and it's not a favor to anybody. So, but it's not at all based on the question of whether or not in the past you've had a hard time paying back loans. Um, and just to try to wrap that one up, it's a, that was a great answer. The credit history one's really interesting. Uh, it's funny in the credit world when they say that, well, if it's a higher risk, then it has to pay back more, which might make sense if you're saying if you've been a company that's been around a long time, then it's stable money we're giving. If we're going to start up, we want a bigger piece, the upside. But when it's a person's credit rating and you say, well, Ed, you have a bad credit, so you're going to have to pay us back more money at the end. But if he can pay us back more money, then he's not actually a credit risk. I, I, he never understand that, but if in the end he ended up paying me more interest than the guy did before, he not only could he pay the loan back, he could pay a higher interest rate. Turned out I was wrong. I, 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 it doesn't make any sense really in doing it. Uh, that for us, a credit rating will come from the experience of working. Uh, like as I mentioned, we make a partnership and it's relationship based. We're the first call you get. We're not it, as the loan fund. We're not going to be ever recover the money unless it's a successful project. So we be, end up be, we're on the same side of the table. We have to make it work out, and we create a working relationship and create trust. Um, if the if the you know if the people want to borrow money never show up to the meetings or won't bring stuff, don't want to share it, it becomes really hard. It's a work based relationship. Um, it's through actual demonstration of people, and it's not nothing to do with anything that might happen in their past when they dealt with for other financial institutions. Um, and and then it's uh, the ability to work. With, we'll work on whatever those projections are, what the plans are, because we're in it to make sure it works. If, if it doesn't pay back, we lost some of that commonly owned money that the financial co-op does. So we have to try to make sure it works, it works out. And it's the working relationship we form um, that, that is, the, and, and the plan we try to call, come up, come, co come up with that uh, is how it works. Can you talk a little bit about the Taharka brothers? Right. So the, the question was asked about the first loan. There's a couple of loans that have been taken over by peers. Uh, there was a loan in LA that we had done, the working world had done, that got taken over by local LA peer. Uh, there was the, the Renaissance Community Cooperatives loans that we've done that now is being managed by local, uh, locally in the Carolinas. But there was a loan that started uh, that bred in Baltimore. Unfortunately, the people who did it, are, they were here, they're gone. Um, that was started after they became, uh, they joined the peer network and they said, um, the, they, the, the people in the loan fund in Baltimore had been working with this newly cooperativized um, black youth owned ice cream factory um, and they'd been working with them working on different uh, technical skills of cooperative governance and such and they said hey there's a they have an ice cream truck that if it gets fixed up it can make a lot of money this summer it needs $15,000 so we helped them their pe the peer network I was their assigned peer worked uh, with them to put together that plan how that would work uh, they worked with the, the people on the ground in Taharka and, and formulated the plan. And then as a, an apprentice peer, they presented it to their credit committee and our credit committee. We all talked together about the loan, questions were asked, and then it was approved. $15,000 was sent down. The ice cream truck rolled out um, already last month. It already turned a profit. It's already bringing money back in. Um, it's already going to repay, and as that money is repaid, so as I mentioned, they were an apprentice member. Ba uh, bread is new. Now that money's being repaid, that money is in their local loan fund, and bread locally make decisions what happens with it. In fact, based on the rules of the cooperative, they are, they are now eligible for matching money to come out of the, the commons fund and go to under control in Baltimore. So every thousand dollars that comes back will be two thousand dollars of local Baltimore money. Um, so that's the it was a, it was an awesome story. Of, and if you're ever in Baltimore and you want the best ice cream you've ever had, buy to Harker Brothers. The key lime pie ice cream is incredible. No, it really is. Oh, it was, it was so good. And, and if you're in Chicago and want to buy worker-owned windows, Armando Robles in the front, he, uh, they, the, their, their cooperative borrowed up to a million dollars to start a worker-owned windows cooperative. Best place to buy windows in the country. I mean it. We wouldn't do any advertising from the stage here. It's not ads. It's, it's not Oh, it's not ads when it's real. Okay. Are there some other uh, additional questions? Yes. Well, he's bringing you a microphone. Thank you. 
Thank, oh, thank you. I have a question about um, getting more uh, money into the regenerative finance world. And it seems like working families contribute a lot to pension funds through their unions. I'm thinking about people like myself. I'm a teacher, nurses, folks like that. So where our money goes is often suspect in my mind. And I'm wondering if there's a way to parlay those trucks of money to do the work that you all do. Shamir? Hey, y'all. Um, my question was um, inspired by a lot of um, worker owners I've been talking to and the idea of radical inclusivity, which is how do we get worker owners or workers to be the ones who know how to do this um, financial investing? Or is that already happening? Like, what are the examples? And how do we transition to like that thing where they're the ones getting to do that? Maybe it's already happening. Okay. Who was next? Thank you. Yeah. Pass it back to him. Uh, my question is about what is the um, limits and requirements of um, the cooperatives that you're, um, is there a limit as to what type of cooperative? And what are the um, requirements, I guess, um, that you have, I guess the most important requirements um, and if there was a time, this is a three-part question, um, if there was a time to review during this weekend for those that are interested in giving a proposal or looking at having you all look at one. Okay. Um, my question is maybe a little longer term. Uh, I'm wondering if what, what communities may be doing uh, for metrics uh, that um, that reflect re, uh, re regeneration. So it seems like real capital isn't in money. Real capital is in resilient communities, whether they're forests or, or neighborhoods. And are there metrics that allow, allow us to experience the benefits of the investment uh, in the regrowth? and regeneration of those, those types of capital. OK. Um, let's take these, and then uh, you'll be next, next round. No, go ahead. <laughs> let's, yeah, so this, this is I'd likely to be all the questions that we'll wrap I'd up. I'd ask Kate this at one time. Uh, just in terms of indigenous communities and reparations and having funds that are really about reparations for indigenous communities, are there models, or, um, or is this model going to be something you think will be transferable, or is that, are you not the right people to ask about that, or just uh, that? We're the right people to ask any question. <laughs> we might not have the answer, but we're the right people to ask. <laughs> Boom. So, you, what? Uh, I want to, to, let me start the indigenous thing first. Um, the last will be first. Um, I, I was at American Indian Mothers Cooperative in Red Springs, North Carolina last weekend. And they have a really exciting project that we're going to be talking to about um, trying to figure out some ways to help it become a reality. Um, that's, they're absolutely one of the communities that, would, that, that we care about in the South, the Southern Reparations Loan Fund is, you know, taking a pretty wide geographic area, but we again have the position of having a loan person who's working pretty much full time, moving across, helping with inquiries, helping people think through business plans, and trying to get some some loans, you know, ready to go out the door. And so they are absolutely among the folks that that uh, th that we are interested in working with. Um, just wanted to make sure that was known. Uh, oh, yeah, I, w I want to say something about the capital. You know, the thing about, you know, real capital is, you know, the, the, the capital that we're thinking about is the capital that is wrapped up in, in machinery, finance, and other stuff. And it's not because it's the only thing of value, but that's the trick we fall into when we want to name everything that's valuable capital. 
Uh, they're all kind of really incredibly important, valuable things about communities. Um, and, and they are community values, and they're, they're, they're really powerful and wonderful, and that's what we ought to be helping to develop. But to, to, to want all those to be capital as opposed to what we're talking about, which is the machinery, the apparatus, and the, the money required to have access to that so that people can be fully productive, that makes it clear who we're talking about. Right now, we live in a world that's dominated by capital. And one of the concerns that I have, and I think it's something we ought to work on, is redefining what capital means so there's actually a whole lot of good stuff. So then when I'm talking about the world is dominated by capital and we live in the, under the rule of capital and that being wrong, that capital shouldn't rule but people should, then all of a sudden capital has got to be all this other wonderful stuff too and it's a confusing discussion. And, and I'm just, just offering that as one of the ways to think about it. So part of our emphasis on talking about money is that's the capital, the capitalists don't like to talk about grassroots folk have an access to because they'll grant you social capital and spiritual capital and cultural capital and you get all this other stuff that they'll tell you it's capital too and then you're left without this money that you need to buy the factory that you need to do to build the chairs and the furniture that you want to have in the homes of your children when they get married. And so I'm just saying that, 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 that there are incredibly more valuable things than that but that stuff is instrumental toward getting to these other real real values. And again, our, sometimes our use of the words kind of clouds what it is that we're talking about. And uh, yeah, capital is not the most valuable thing in the world, but it is instrumental and it should be toward us getting and creating the things we need for our communities. Um, okay, so I need to, there were a couple of technical questions I want to make sure to cover um, about. I mean, I think you, I think you probably do good on the pension funds and um, the worker owners gain, being involved in the decision making or in the, or in the training. Um, it's actually one of the best ways for the the financial cooperative to spread. So one of there's a number of different peers that Michelle uh, mentioned. One of them is in Baltimore, as I mentioned. That first loan was done there. Um, and one of the reasons they've been able to move forward very quickly is because they have a 10-year history of building a worker cooperative there called Red Emma's. And workers from that cooperative are the ones who then are, are the, some of the core of the people who formed the local loan fund and are actually the ones who went out and, and worked on building the loan for Taharka Brothers. So actually, um, Ro, who's a woman who works in Red Emma's, was the direct loan agent working with people from Taharka. And she had a, a coach, coaching from Kate Khatib, who's... Uh, also a worker owner in Red Emma's and has been for many, many years. So they're, um, they needed a lot less resources in the end to build themselves up to be able to figure out how to do a loan because they had already gone through all this before. Uh, so, you know, long, long run, bringing people from worker cooperatives into loan funds and vice versa is going to be the best way we're going to grow um, rather than just teaching people in the abstract. So um, there, has been a, there has been a lot of that. We need a lot more of that, of people going through that, uh, cycling back and forth. Um, Limitation on the cooperatives that apply. We haven't had, a, there's been all sorts of different types of cooperatives that apply. It's really about, it's not about initially being a cooperative, it's about having democratic control of, produ of production or of the needs of survival. So of land, of, of productive, um, productive capital, if I'm gonna, I'm gonna now he'd problematize, I won't say that, of productive stuff. Um, so it's, it's, have, it's, it has to have democracy and we've worked with groups that didn't even have a legal incorporation, let alone um, if they decided it was, it was a co-op because they really had uh, demonstrated a, a d democratic control internally. Um, we worked with trusts, we worked with worker, um, we worked with consumer cooperatives, product, uh, producer cooperatives, so it's really about that democratic functioning. Um, no one did approach us during this, uh, I, that I know of, I'm gonna approach me, uh, about, um, about applying for a loan during this weekend, but it's only Saturday. Uh, Regenerative benefits, real capital, I think that's good. And there are, and I think Michelle's gonna get to talk a little about this, indigenous, um, there, there are some indigenous groups that are involved in um, this next year's group of peer, uh, in the peer network gathering. There's gonna be one coming from Alaska and maybe one from, um, also from uh, Arizona, but, uh, so there is some, now getting actually is that, that's not the answer to has reparations happening. That might mean like say giving all the land back and letting them, letting rent be, but you know, it's not, it's not an answer to the reparations question, but there is a real space. I mean, and it has resonated 
it's surprising me how often this has resonated with people across the world. But as we mentioned, this was not made up now in reaction to, to, capital, to finance capitalism. These are very natural ways of people in many parts of the world have uh, traditional ways of sharing um, finance. So it's, it shouldn't be a surprise, I guess, that it resonates in many places. Oh, um, so right now the financial cooperative can take investment from accredited investors or unaccredited investors in certain states. And so hopefully in the future, as more capital comes in, we'll be able to leverage that capital to have more access to public markets. Um, and, and hopefully pension funds will shift all their capital into worker-controlled, uh, community-controlled loan funds. Um, and... Yeah, and I think something I was thinking about a lot when you're talking about this inversion of the investor uh, community relationship is that it's not enough to just shift capital into communities. You also have to shift power, and that involves changing a lot of structures and norms, and, um, and that is what like the work of non-extractive finance is about. Um, so just briefly, yeah, on the indigenous communities, so um, there's two other um, groups and kind of funds that are we're in conversation with. One is the Indigenous Environmental Network, um, which is a long, long time um, leader network of um, indigenous communities and and some tribal governments that are well, no, not not usually tribal governments, indigenous communities um, that are that are um, working to transform their communities, and um, they're interested in creating a loan fund and we're in conversation with them about you know that in the context of joining the financial cooperative and the peer network um, so if any of you have ideas about how we can resource such a thing we are actively looking for support for that um, they have they have lots of projects that are actually um, they believe are like ready they have business plans they're ready to be funded but they haven't had the capacity to um, to seek this kind of non-extractive finance in that way. So, um, and then the Tonka Fund is another. So Native American Foods is a, a really great model of um, an indigenous-led business, um, and they want to be buying buffalo meat. They, they do like buffalo jerky in the Tonka Bar. Um, they have to buy a lot of their buffalo meat from white land own or or buffalo producers um, because there isn't enough native grown buffalo anymore. And a lot of tribal governments are leasing their land to landowners that can rent, and that tends to be landowners with a lot of access to capital. And so um, they want to create a fund that can support um, indigenous communities in restoring buffalo on that prairie land um, in the Dakotas and um, are really excited about a, an indigenous or, or I'm sorry, a non-extractive um, model. Um, and it's it's a really good example because there's a built-in market um, given that Tonka brand has already achieved like market share. They're just trying to um, build the capacity of indigenous folks to then benefit from that buffalo. Um, and then I just, the last thing I want to say on the pension funds, I yes, <laughs> totally. That's, that's um, no question that um, it's in the interest of the working class to transform the way the economy works and where they're, like the wealth that they're generating is being invested. Um, and so we are totally committed. And Movement Generation has an initiative called Climate Workers that um, in the Bay Area we're organizing um, people in the labor movement who are wanting to support the labor movement and, and specifically trade unions in um, advancing a just transition and you know we've seen nurses we've seen teachers really come out um, in in support of advancing a climate justice agenda in you know after decades where unions um, were not supposed to talk about industries that that uh, they supposedly didn't get impacted by so you couldn't talk about coal mining if you're a teacher or you're a nurse and we all know that um, it's all connected. And so increasingly, um, it's been really exciting to see service workers. Um, we work closely with SEIU and um, fast food workers. And, you know, a lot of those workers see the many, like the, the layers of how the economy is working to just extract wealth and, and oppress and mine from their communities, both back home and here. 
and I think are some of the leaders of these kinds of not only workplace fights, but also um, pension funds. So. Yeah, we're going to have to wind it up now. A, a couple of things I just want to say. Um, we, we're living in a time that is, you know, fraught with a whole lot of danger. Uh, there are devastated communities where some of the people in the communities are clearly not valued uh, as members of those communities because there are armed folk who are agents agents of and enforcers of maintaining the property relations as they currently exist and in fact agents of capital that currently are afraid of their authority being challenged in, in any kind of way. 2.30 in the morning, I was talking to my son talk about being tear gassed out in Phoenix, uh, Arizona with 5,000 people in a, in a demonstration, uh, except the wind blew the stuff, the, the tear gas the other way, and they kept going. Um, but I, I just wanted to say that this discussion around democratizing finance is ultimately a dis discussion around rebuilding communities and transforming the kind of role that is played where capital dominates and directs the police so that people, again, direct whatever force and authority there is in their communities in the direction of people and people's needs rather than in the direction of enhancing capital. And it is for that reason that we have to democratize finance in order to create and rebuild the devastated communities on the basis and around the principles of, of meeting human needs and elevating the quality of life within community for all. And that's what all of this is ultimately about. Thank you so very much. And thanks to Brendan and Michelle and Kate for being here on the panel. And thank you for all of you for your participation and the very intelligent questions you asked. And thank you out there in cyberspace for watching us online.